Welcome to Are You Psychic? This session is exploring whether we can test whether someone is psychic, that is whether they can read another person's mind. You will need a pen, something to write on which might be a worksheet that your teacher has given you and a calculator would be really helpful. I know that most of you are going to be at school in a classroom, but it may be that some of you are at home as well. There are going to be a various points during the session that we ask you to pause the video and do either an activity or some calculations, but we'll let you know when we want you to do this. My name's Christine. I work for AMSP, which is an organisation that encourages people to continue taking and enjoying mathematics. I'm based at the University of Worcester, and universities are great places to help you think about your future and careers options. They also do a lot for the local community. For example, at Worcester, we lent lots of equipment to hospitals during the pandemic. My name's Abby. I also work for the AMSP based at the University of Manchester in the maths department. I know that your maths teachers will have talked a lot about how important maths is for solving real life problems and lots of different situations and they'll have promoted problem solving to you all the time. Um, but you'll be amazed to see how many mathematicians work with members of other professions. So, for example, in the department at the moment, we've got people working with the airports on the, the scanners that you go through at security. Uh, we've got a lot of people working with medics. So, for example, a friend of mine is working on knot theory, where she's trying to solve the problem of antibiotic, antibiotic resistant diseases. It's very hard to say that one. And people working in business, finance um, and many, many more. Today, we're going to look at some maths that's using all these different areas. So you're here because your teachers would like you to consider doing maths after year 11 and this session is looking at the mathematics of using probability to help you make important decisions. Now I'm sure most of you have read the title we had up on the page and you may be wondering to yourself, am I psychic? Um, so what we're going to have a look at today is a, a test used for psychic ability and amazingly scientists have created a lot of tests to try and test their uh, psychic ability. The one we're going to use today is called the Zener test and what it involves is uh, predicting cards and we have five different symbols. Christine have you got an example of some cards that we can show everybody? So I've got five different cards with different symbols on and you can see there's lots of different symbols there. OK, and we'll put these up on the screen when we want you to use them so you can see what the symbols are. And what Christine will do is she's going to hold up a card and this is what the scientists would do. Hold up a card and everyone has to guess what it is. And if there are five different symbols, then even if I just guess, I should have a one in five card chance of getting this card right. So if I do five goes at the test, I ought to get one right out of five. That's right, Christine. But um, actually, I am basically guessing and I'm psychic and I can prove it. So hopefully on the screen, you can see now um, my first ever go. This is genuinely, I wanted to test this out. So I had a go on an online website. Um, but this was 25 cards rather than five. So by your reckoning, I should be getting around five of them. Correct. Is that right? That's right. And I didn't. I got 12. That's over double the amount. And I thought I was pretty pleased with myself, but the computer was even more pleased with me. I put the arrows in for emphasis, but if you look, it says evidence for ESP is, and that's extrasensory perception, is very good. So you got 12 out of 25, right? So I wonder why the computer is saying 12 out of 25 is good enough, because that's not even half right. So the maths we look at might help us with that. And I don't believe in psychic ability. I am really skeptical. So I want to see it happen, not just see a certificate. So perhaps we could find out more about this test by doing it together and afterwards focus on the maths behind the website's calculation. So let's do the test here and now, and let's do five trials, not 25 to speed it up. I am absolutely up for that, Christine, so I can prove to you my psychic ability. And what I will do is I'll put up on the screen the five symbols, because what might be interesting is the same time as me having a go is if everybody in the classroom or at home had a go at doing this too. So um, what you can do is maybe hold up the cards one at a time. So like this. Yep. And, and then we can guess what they are. And everyone in the classroom can write it down. I think if you've got a worksheet, there should be space on your worksheet for recording this. And then you can tell me that I'm right. 
<laughs> so everyone in the school and at home joining, the symbols are on the screen so you know which ones you can choose and on the worksheet. I'll hold up one card at a time like this so that you can see the back and on some paper you can draw the symbol or write the name and then I'll show you straight away so you can see whether you were right or not. So everyone ready with some paper and a pen? I'm ready. Yeah. Okay, Christine, let's go. Okay, so here is your first card. Okay, so this one is a circle. I'm afraid it's a star. Hmm. Are you really trying your hardest, Christine? I know you're quite sceptical, but you still need to try Different. hard to transmit and think this in your mind. I am holding up the second card. I am Brilliant. staring at the symbol. I'm concentrating 100% on the symbol. This one is definitely a circle. I'm afraid it's a cross. Okay. Well, two down, three to go. So you've still got three chances. So third card, third card. I'll try it over here. See, is that better? If I, I concentrate think on the left. This one is a square. Afraid it's a circle. Okay, two to go. Fourth card. Okay. Fourth card. This one is a wave. This one is a star. Last chance, last card. Okay, I'm gonna go for not guessing, I'm predicting circle again. I'm afraid it's the wave. That didn't go as well as I'd hoped. Um, but I get the impression that maybe you're you're not transmitting as well as you could, and it is harder uh, over over the internet than it might be if we were in the same room together. Okay, so if you've had a go at doing this at home, um, then you will have a good idea whether you're psychic or not. I'm, I'm sure I can sense that some of you are. Um, if you are in the classroom, maybe teachers, you could ask the class for their results. So what we're gonna suggest now is that you pause the video and collecting the results of your class. So now that you've seen the test in action, you might have an opinion on how many correct is enough for psychic ability. So you might also look at your class and think, well, there's somebody in my class that got four right out of five and I didn't know that they had that sort of ability. So everyone in the class, have a think. What do you think is enough? Is one enough to suggest psychic ability? Is it two? Is it three? Is it more? So we're just going to pause again. Teachers ask a class what they think a suitable pass mark would be to investigate further for psychic ability. Okay, so you've probably got a, a range of results in your class. So it'd be interesting to see what everyone thought would be a pass mark for psychic ability. Um, I'm wondering whether it might be three, Christine, because actually that's quite a lot more than the one needed. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure. And when we've done this with students in the classroom, some do say three is enough, but lots more say four or five. And skeptics like me think it's got to be all five before we even consider whether there's such a thing. So what we could do is try the test again, but do a lot more trials and see if we get some better evidence. Yes, and I, I don't think I trust you to do this test again, but luckily I have another option, Christine. So um, what we've actually done is we've produced a website, which I'm going to put up for you now. And this is a Zena card test. So you should be able to see that on your screen now. Um, yes. This works in the same way that we've got a card and you have to guess what the, the symbols are. We've got five trials again, so we're going to work with that. If you want to have a go in your own time at doing 10 or 25, then you will have the access to this at another point. So I'm going to click start and you can see it highlights what my guesses are. So I'm going to just have a go and we'll start with a cross. Just guessing this time, Christine, I'm not trying to get it right. A uh, wave, a star, and a square. I, yeah, I got zero right. And the great thing about this is it records your results. So if we go down to the bottom, if I scroll down, you can see I did one earlier where I got two right, and here I've got zero right. So out of the, the all the ones I've done, 50% of them have been zero, 50% of them have been two right. So it records your results. 
um, and we can we can see those so we can collect together a list of the results of everyone that that, that does this test um, to get a long term view that we'll talk a little bit about later on. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a go at doing some of these and we're going to ask you to do the same. So you can either use this website and I'll put that up on the screen. But if you've got the resources um, from us, then you should be able to see that as well. So let me just get my PowerPoint back up again. So in the classroom, you can either do the app or teachers, you might use the cards and you might see whether any of your students are able to read your minds, and do the, do the test live. OK, so this is the, the website address. And as I say, you can do it live. You can have a go at doing this. You can do this on the whiteboard or if everybody's got their own devices, that would be a great way to do it. While you're doing this for five minutes, um, we're going to have a go at doing some of the tests. And so you should see a live graph bar result coming up on the screens in a minute. Um, if you would prefer just to pause it or spend a little bit longer on that activity, obviously, then feel free to do that as well. That's a really interesting graph, Abby. So what do you think? Yeah, I'd be interested to know if everyone's graph looks like this. Um, so as you predicted, one is the most common, followed then by zero, two, three. We haven't got any fives, but we have got a four. So surely, Christine, you've got to believe that the person who got four there has got psychic ability. I'm not convinced, because how many results have we got there? Not even 300. So one in 300. Now that's only 10 classes in schools, so you'd think 10 classes doing this, maybe one person will get that money? Well, possibly. I think actually we've got to the stage now where we're gonna to need to have a look at some calculations and just see how likely or unlikely it is to get four so that we, so that we can talk about this with a bit more confidence. Um, but what I'd like to talk about first, I think this is really important, is to see how mathematicians go about this. So how do mathematicians make these decisions? So the first thing that mathematicians do is they have to identify a problem. So for us, our problem is, can we test whether somebody has psychic ability with an independent, reliable test? Okay, and then, they have to set up a question or a hypothesis. So our hypothesis is when you do the Zena test, if you get four or more correct, then that would be sufficient evidence to investigate you further. For so you say investigate further rather than have psychic ability. Is that what how it works? Well, you, it depends how you feel about it. You might say that your test is so rigorous that it's sufficient to say, yes, this person has psychic ability. I would say we don't know yet whether that's yeah. right. So I'd say I just investigate. That, that's probably fair that uh, you probably want to do it more than once. If you get a four out of five, for example, right the first time, you'd want to be checking that you got that again and you could do that consistently. So I think that's a, a reasonable comment to do. Uh, the next stage is collecting data. And that's, one of the things we've just done, we've done the test lots and lots of times. So we've collected a large amount of data, but we've collected it for a lot of people. Perhaps it would be sensible to have one person do the test a thousand times, although they might get a little bored if they did it a thousand times in a row. And then look at that one person's data. Yeah, I guess what we can do is we can check whether the population as a whole of people who did this test, our panel of people doing this test, whether they're more psychic than, than it would suggest by if they just guessed or not. So we, we, we've got some, uh, some data there that we can use. Uh, and then we need to do some calculations of probability. So we could look at um, looking at guessing. So we can't, we can't say what's the probability that you'll get it right if you've got psychic ability, but we can say what's the probability that you will get one card right if you guess. And then, All right, and then we can pair our results with that. Yes. So okay. compare the experiment with the calculation. And you might think that's finished, but then we need to actually answer the question. I think one of the things that we need to do for that is maybe, and we can talk about this a little bit later, is, is set that sort of pass mark and, and, and use the evidence that we've got to, to work out what that should be. So I think we should get started on some maths. 
Um, right. Fair enough? Yes. Ready, okay, my favorite part, I like doing maths. Yeah. Okay, so the probability of getting a first card right, so. Yeah, so this is one of the things mathematicians do, they start simple. So instead of thinking about the whole test, we'll just focus on one card and say, what's the probability of getting one simple right if you are guessing? And that would be, well, there are five cards, aren't there? So that the chances are that you would get, you've got a one in five chance of getting it right, which is 0 0.2. Um, so the chance of getting it wrong then becomes one minus that, which is 0 0.8. And I'm sure everyone in school got that right. Yes, I'm sure you did. So, well, if you remember, and I don't think I really want to, I didn't get any of them right. I got zero questions right when we did it before. So I wonder how likely that is. So you'd want to get the first one wrong and the second one wrong and the third one wrong and the fourth one wrong and the fifth one wrong like you did. Oh, thank you very much, Christine. Um, and if you remember from your probability, that means multiplying those because you've got that wrong and that wrong. And we can do that a little bit more easily, can't we? Because we could put in our calculator 0 0.8 to the power of 5 and that gives us 0 0.328. And it might be easier to, to put this into a percentage, 33%. Um, I can't remember what our graph's like, so in a minute maybe it'll be interesting to compare the results, but I, um, yeah, we, we can have a look at those results and see if we got around 33% or that sort of number. I think it was but, about 35%, so that's pretty close, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see, I can't remember off the top of my head, but what we're really interested in is the probability of getting all five cards right. So we're gonna ask you to do this. So in the same way that we calculated zero cards right, can you calculate the probability of getting all five cards right? So I'm gonna ask you to pause the video now and work this out. You've got a, a worksheet, so you might choose to write it on the worksheet or you might be just writing it on paper. Okay, so shall we see if you got the same as us? Mm. Uh, so in the same way that we got 0.8 to the power 5, if you do this one, you should get 0.2 to the 5, which is 0 0.00032. That's a tiny number. That's not 3%, not 0.3%. I think that's 0.032%. Is that right, Christine? It is. So that's what, 3 in 10,000 people would get that. So definitely here, if somebody got five cards right, you would know they're not guessing that they're definitely psychic, wouldn't you? Well, I wouldn't, because I would say if we did this experiment enough times and we had 10,000 people do the experiment, I would expect three people to get it right. And that's not absolutely impossible. He just has everyone in a time to do it. That, that's true. That is interesting. So these really rare events can happen. Yes, not impossible. Not impossible. Okay, so let's fill in some of the other numbers. Think about some of the other ones. So maybe what we'll look at next is getting one right out of five. Okay, so by my reckoning, that means getting one right, so that's a 0 0.2, and then getting all the other runs wrong, which is a 0 0.8. So I calculated 0 0.2 times 0 0.8 to the power four, but that only gives me 8%, and that's not higher than the number. We thought this would be the most common one, didn't we? We did, but... I think there's more than one way to do it. So have a ah. think in the classroom. Is that the only way to get one right out of five? Because I've calculated getting the first one right, but yeah. we could have got the second one right, so, or the third, or the fourth. So I think, I wonder if you agree with me in the classroom that that's five different ways. And if we multiply that number by five, 41%, that does sound a little bit more like it, doesn't it? It does. And thinking back to the graph that we just had, it seemed to be settling down just under 40%. Of All right, so getting close to that sort of number. It did take a while to get there. It was very interesting watching it up and down. Sometimes zero was in the lead. It was like, it was very exciting. I was getting quite excited by watching that, that change all the time. Um, well, and we'll go back and have a look at, compare these numbers in a little bit. So we're going to ask you now to have a go at calculating four right in the same way and see if you can work out the remaining probabilities. So what you're going to need to do is not only calculate the, the numbers, these are the ones we've got so far, so you're going to not, not only calculate 
the 0.8 and the 0.2, but these numbers at the beginning, which are how many different ways of doing it. Now, I believe that on your worksheet, you have got a, a blank table that you can fill in, um, or otherwise you can just draw it and do these calculations. So again, if you pause the video now and have a go at doing these calculations, um, and we've given you a couple of extension tasks here. So can you see any patterns in the table? And you might use these patterns to help you do the calculations as well, but also a challenge that if you want to take this a little bit further, what about looking at 10 trials instead of five or a different number? Okay, so the, we can already see the beginnings of some patterns in that table. So if we look at the 0.8, the first one's 0.8 to the power of five, and the next one's 0.8 to the power of four. So that would suggest that the next one's going to be 0.8 to the power of three, 0.8 to the power of two, and all the way down to the bottom, where it would be 0.8 to the power zero, which is the same at one. Ah, and I wonder if the 0.2s, I would probably guess that they go in the opposite direction, 0.2 to the power five, and then going up to four, three, two. And that's a, that one suggests that as well, doesn't it? So we can see those patterns. So the, the more difficult bits are calculating the number of different ways that can happen. Um, so shall we have a look at that for four and then think about how we would do that for the, the two and three, which is a little bit trickier. Let's so for the, the results. Yeah, so for the four, you should count, we should get the same number that we got last time. So five different ways of doing that. Because four, four out of five right is the same as saying one out of five wrong. So we'd expect to get five again. And actually that result's quite interesting. I've highlighted that result because it's 0.6%. That's less than 1%. And that was one of the numbers that we were really interested in. Um, and I would say that getting four right is less than 1%. And 1% is one of the numbers that we quite often use to say, well, that is a level that we are confident in a significant level for showing us that we need, we've got need evidence, that there is evidence that we can investigate this further. The statisticians often talk about a 5% confidence level or a 1% confidence yeah. level. And you may have seen these, if you've ever read a, a newspaper article or heard something on the news where they talk about statistics, they'll quite often mention these figures for how, um, how confident they are that the results are correct. So uh, it does look like four out of five, right, would, would fit in with that, that would give us that idea. Should we have a look at all the results? Yes, let's have a look at the pattern and see if I was right. Okay, so we've got the 0.8s going in the pattern you expected, the 0.2s. And then we've got these numbers, the 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. It may be that some of you out there um, recognise those numbers and think, I've heard those numbers before. And this is another thing that you can investigate a little bit further. We're not going to go into this in great detail, but ask your teacher and they might be able to tell you a little bit more about this. But thinking about how do we get that 10? Um, and this is something that mathematicians have to be careful that they do. They have to be very systematic. So you might have got 10 for the number there. Or maybe you missed one and got nine or uh, put one twice and got 11. But mathematicians have to be careful that they are very systematic in doing this and so the way that I wrote this is I did all the ones on the top row with the first one right so the first one right first and second first and third first and fourth first and fifth then all the ones with the second one right the third and the fourth so I wrote my results out quite um systematically so we've just done all of that work by hand and make, done all the listing to get all those different numbers and had to work systematically to check it it'd be great if we could have technology to do all the calculations and do all the organizing for us so that we just do the thinking about the numbers. Okay, so this is something that mathematicians do. We do use technology. I'm gonna show you an example now. Uh, this is a GeoGebra file, which will do these calculations for us. And it's great because it does, as you say, it means we can spend our time and energy interpreting the results. Uh, so these are the figures that we calculated before, the 0.3, 3, 0.41, et cetera. And we can talk a little bit about those and compare them with our results in a minute. Um, but I'm just gonna explain this for you. So this is working a distribution. And in this case, it's the binomial distribution because when we've got a card, each time we do it, guess, we can get it right or wrong. So there's two possibilities, so hence binomial. We had five trials and each time we had a probability of 0.2 of getting it right. And these are the calculations that we get. Um, and we've put those into a graph because it often makes it look easier. And that means that we can compare it with our 
results than we got earlier. So do you think that would be useful to have a look at? I think so. If we look at the red graph compared to this one, and then we've got the experimental graph next to the theoretical graph. OK, so I'll put that on there now. So this is the graph of the results that we collected earlier. Um, and you can see that we've got the same kind of shape. So we've got the, the one is the highest result. And I think, as you said, it was just under 40 percent, whereas in reality, if we calculated it, it would be 0.41. And there's two reasons. So there are, there are two reasons. It could be just we just haven't got enough results for it to settle down. Or it could be that our population, that our people who did the trials aren't working in the way that you would expect if they were guessing. Yes, maybe they're not actually guessing. Maybe there is a tiny bit of evidence, but I would say- actually, Yeah, actually there's evidence that they're, they're less than psychic things. They seem to be really good at getting zeros. That's what about 38% of getting zeros, let me, um, which is higher than the, the calculation. But the number of twos, what's that? That's about, that's just under 20%. The number of threes is just under five. The number of fours is about 0.6. So that's actually quite similar to what we calculate and no fives, but the, the, the shape is similar. Now, what might be interesting is that actually when I've done this, uh, we've got the long-term graph of what we've done. So let me scroll up and you can see that. So that is over nearly, that's over 4,000 tests, and that's what the graph looks like. And if we look at the percentages here, then that's a lot closer. 32% for zeros, 41%. Then it's just a little bit higher for the twos. Three, the, the threes is about 5%, so that's close, and the fours. And still, still no fives in all of that time. So if you did get a five, you would be, you might be surprised, but that's the way random probability works. If you're guessing, you would expect every now and again to get a five if you do well, this. Well, I have a confession to make, Christine, that although I got that psychic mark of 12 out of 25 the first time I did that test, the next time I test, I think I got zero or one, which was uh, very low. So these unusual events genuinely can happen. I want to go back to looking at GeoGebra graph again, though, because I think that's really interesting and we can, we can extend that because the whole joy of that is that we don't just have to look at the, the five results we do, we can look at some other numbers as well. So this is the one that we did, but what if I change that to 10? We've got a pass mark here that we said of, let's have a look. If I move this along, that's more four or more gave us that, that result that was less than 1%. And we said 1% would be quite a good cutoff, didn't we? Yeah, so we're saying our hypothesis of four or more is sufficient to investigate further is supported for five trials, but what would it be for 10 trials? Yeah. I wonder what everyone in the classroom thinks. You might decide to pause and just have a think. What number is it going to be to get that probability under 1%? Okay, well, I'll give you a quick pause and I'm gonna do a countdown to pressing that so that we can have a look at the graph. So three, two, one. So that's the graph for 10 trials. So it looks, it's similar, it goes up and then down again. Um, and if I move this along, the probability of getting four or more right is 12%. You can see that at the bottom here. Five or more right, six. Oh, and when we get to six, that goes under 1%. I wonder how many people thought it would be eight because that was double the, the number that you needed for, for um, five. So we've had four out of five as our controlling pass mark six out of ten you did a test for 25 yeah so. I'd be interested to see that I'm not going to ask you to get this but for my curiosity I'm interested to see what what that what that pass mark for 25 and if that sort of tallies with what what I got so if I got 25 um let's go to the numbers along here four percent one okay so 11 it looks like a, a 11 out of 25 so that's that's um less than half Get, gives you that percentage that's less than one percent chance of doing it right okay i think it'd be interesting to look at one more shall we have a look at 100 100 so shall we give everyone time again so if you want to think about it in your classroom have a conversation you've now got three results so rather than working it out what's your instincts what do you think will be the pass mark for 100 trials 
Okay, again, I'm going to pause it and then I'm going to count down. So three, two, one. Oh, don't we get a lovely graph? That's a really interesting shaped graph. And some of you might have um, be familiar with graphs that look like that. So it's, it looks a lot smoother and it's got that sort of almost symmetrical shape about it that uh, you see in something called the bell curve or the normal distribution, which is something that you will explore further if you go in and do maths um, post 16. And it's something that mathematicians use a lot. But what we're interested in is that pass mark. So we want to get under 1%. So I keep moving that along, but we're nearly there. 31. So that's less than a third of the marks right. So it does show that you have to be more consistent, but, but obviously you don't need as many marks right or as much as, as high a percentage of the marks right when, you're, when you've got 100. So a test out of 100, 31 gives you less than a 1% chance of that happening. So that would give you like a pass mark for for further evidence of psychic ability. So if we were going back to our hypothesis, we'd be saying a hypothesis would be about setting a pass mark in advance, then doing an experiment to gather the data, doing the calculations to get the theoretical data and doing a comparison. And if our experimental data was very different to the theoretical data, that would suggest there are people who are worth exploring further for psychic ability. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, psychic ability, what, what's, what use is that? That's a little bit frivolous, isn't it? And I said at the beginning that this was something that was very commonly used in a lot of different careers. So let's have a look at some of those, because as I say, this area of mathematics is really key to a number of careers. And here are some examples. So this is Justice Ahito. He's a researcher in childhood malnutrition. And so just like we've done, he's asked himself a question. Does where you live increase your risk of childhood malnutrition? And then obviously he will be collecting data and having a look and to see whether there's ever any evidence of that. Um, Claire Burke is a climate change attribution scientist. And we hear a lot about climate change on the news. And her question that she asks herself is, are extreme weather events caused by man-made climate change? So she looks at trends in weather, for example, floods, droughts, storms, heat waves, and runs models to see if man-made climate change has caused those changes. And this is Dave Collett, using statistics to save lives. Isn't that a great thing to be able to say about yourself? So um, Dave uses mathematical skills to decide which patients will get transplants and how to increase the number of registered donors. But what's interesting is he says that skills in problem solving are essential, which I'm sure you're hearing from your teachers all, this, all the time, and that these skills are developed through studying statistics. Um, so what Christine will do is she's going to tell you a little bit more about your choices after GCSE. So I'm sure you've all heard of A-level maths and probably AS maths, but there are two other courses as well. There's A-level further maths and core maths, which is a relatively new qualification. So we'll start by thinking about A-level maths. The work we did today was probability and statistics and that all of it comes into AS maths. So it's the sort of maths you would do in year 12. And if you go on to do further maths, further maths is another A-level, but it's it's not necessarily harder maths. There is harder maths in there that builds on what you do in A-level maths, but there are other topics as well. So there's decision maths or discrete maths, which is looking at how you use mathematics to help you make decisions. It's used a lot in business to help them ensure that the decisions they're making are the best for the company. There's also complex numbers, which comes into engineering and aeronautics. Core maths is completely different. Core maths is a separate qualification that is not as big as an A-level, but it's used to help you if you are doing other subjects and you just need to keep your maths going. So for example, if you're doing A-level geography, there's quite a lot of maths in that. And the maths you do in core maths would help you and make sure that you're getting all the geography mathematics right. And the sort of subjects core maths helps, there's biology, psychology, social sciences, chemistry. So if you're doing A-levels and you've already decided you don't want to carry on doing A-level maths, 
check your courses, see if there's a lot of mathematics in it, and talk to your teachers about whether core maths would help you. And you might be surprised to know that A-level PE has a lot of mathematics in it. So just check with your teachers and see if it's a, if there's something there that is the right course for you to help you in your future careers. Yeah, it's hard to think of many subjects or careers that aren't going to benefit from doing some maths post-16. And, um, and not only that, but there are courses that will reduce your offers, aren't they? If, if you do something like core maths or further maths, they will give yeah. you lower offers. So have a look at our website. If you click on any of the topic areas, you'll find that there's a students area. So if you clicked on core maths, you'll find students for core maths. And that tells you all about the course and how it will help you and what it might make, how it might make a difference when you go on to university and apply. OK, so I think we're nearly finished. So I just want to say a big congratulations. That's both to the people who have proved that they're psychic, because, Christine, I know there are people out there who are, but um, also to, to those of you who've managed to follow everything we've done today. We've done a big chunk of the statistics that you do in year 12, and we've covered that fairly fast. Um, but if you did enjoy that and want to take it a little bit further, remember, you could always investigate the same thing for 10 trials. Um, and I think there are some other examples of ways that you could extend this activity on the worksheet. And if you want to have a go at testing your psychic ability again, that website is free for you to use at any point. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact us at enrichment.amsp.org.uk, putting Are You Psychic in the subject line. And if you've enjoyed this recording, there are other ones available. The, the website link is on the page, but you can find that easily from the AMSP website. And you might want to think about whether the test we did was valid. Is it valid to test your psychic ability against an app? So we'll say goodbye. Thank you for joining us. So goodbye from me. Goodbye and thank you very much. Well done for, for following us today.